entered a place that is not for the living. If there is hell on earth, I think that was it. Most frightening moment of my life. Even though she was gone, I, I wanted to be in the same place where she was. I, I had no idea that what I did was very dangerous. Every movement that I did was like the knife cutting me. There was a change in the atmosphere. It was electrified. I looked over towards the closet. I was really afraid. I was really, really afraid. Standing in the closet, looking at me, I was freaking out. You know, maybe we entered a place that is not for the living to even visit. That's a stark, cold, dead place. Um, if there is hell on earth, I think that was it. Most frightening moment of my life. Um, I got a call from my manager saying that you have received an offer to shoot a film in Santa Fe to play a military captain who oversaw a notorious prison in Iraq, Abu Ghraib, and the time that uh, the US military spent there and, and what went on there. And I just thought that that would be a new adventure and a new character to add to the resume. And I accepted the role. We were shooting outside of Santa Fe in the old main prison facility, which has now obviously been closed down for many years. It was considered to be a level six supermax facility with a gas chamber and a death row. If you were gonna pick a location to recreate something as horrible as what went on for 30 years uh, uh, during Saddam Hussein's rule in Iraq of that prison, you draw the conclusion that it was an appropriate place to shoot that film. I flew into uh, Albuquerque. I landed at about midnight. The producer came to pick me up. We were driving to Santa Fe, which is about an hour. The crew hadn't gotten there. No trucks were there yet. I was the first actor. On the way, he said, I've been, I've been out here scouting this location, and uh, would you like to go see the prison where we're shooting? It's old main prison in Santa Fe. So, uh, oh, you want to take a look at it now? Oh, yeah. Out here in the middle of the desert. I said, sure, because I thought that it would help inform me as an artist, as an actor. We pulled up to the main entrance, and it kind of through the headlights, it kind of looked like uh, all brick and bars. Uh, we see the barbed wire fence. And the, the main entryway looked like the entryway of any normal building. It was uh, sort of steel and glass with a lock. And when we got inside the lobby, to the right and to the left, there were giant hallways with gates. We, we proceeded uh, down the hallway. And the producer said, would you like to take a little tour of death row and, uh, and the gas chamber? And I said, uh, why the hell not? We had one flashlight between the two of us and two cell phones uh, emitting light. We went through down the long corridor in order to get to death row. And when we finally got there, I flashed my flashlight down on the floor and I saw marks in the concrete. There were about 10 of them and they just 
Looked like they were like hacking marks from a heavy object. And then we went to the other side and we walked through death row. And it was just like this endless, endless series of, of bars and gates that we had to, to pass through in order to get to the gas chamber. We walked down the hallway and I saw a blackened spot in the concrete that it was forever blackened spot. After taking all of that in, he said, if you want to see the gas chamber, you know, we're going to have to go down into the basement. There's no light down there, so you really have to stick with me. And I said, uh, yeah, no problem. I, I'm not going anywhere. there was a, uh, a darkened uh, entryway. We went down one flight of stairs, took a left, went down another flight of stairs. It was very dirty and very dusty and very, very, very quiet. And all I could hear was uh, my own breathing and his breathing. When we got off the third flight of stairs, he turned around and said, this is the back entrance to the gas chamber. This is where the gallery views the execution. So we walked into that room. We could see some light. And it was like an orange glow, a faint orange glow. And there was a candle burning in the corner, an old red, smallish candle. The look on his face was terror. And I said, did you? And he said, He said, do you really want to continue? And I said, as long as we're here, let's just, let's just continue. We left that area. We saw the back of the gas chamber. It was this sort of a glass and steel structure. It almost looked like an old submarine upended. Um, and you could see the chair inside. We went into the uh, front entrance of the gas chamber, and it had a door uh, like you see on a ship, where it, it has a, a wheel, a steel wheel that you turn, and then it opens up. Very, very heavy door. So then as I entered the, uh, the gas chamber uh, and turned around and sat down uh, in the chair, uh, I was shaking a little bit. I was a little bit sweaty and a little nervous, obviously. It's not every day you sit in a gas chamber chair. My training is such that I don't back away from those experiences. So I, I knew he wasn't going to do it. And I said, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and sit in there. And... I heard a knock. There were three knocks. Sounded like they were coming from below, like somebody was underneath the prison, and there were no levels below the basement. And I looked at him. I noticed that he was fixated on the viewing area behind me. And then I turned around. And 
I looked at him, I noticed that he was fixated on the viewing area behind me. And then I turned around. In the viewing area, we saw black shapes sitting in chairs. We ran so fast. We bound up one set of stairs. We bound up the second set of stairs. And we look up. At the top of the stairs, there's the silhouette. And we froze. And we turned our flashlights off, and we just stared at it. it. Seemed to have a straight body with wings sort of coming out. It's the only way I can describe it. It didn't look like a human being. It had uh, an energy coming out of it that was foreboding. It was pretty much filling the space and it started to spread its wings. And we were scared out of our minds, and we, there just seemed to be this noise, this, this cacophony of, of voices and yelling and screaming, and we covered our ears. And then we looked up, and it started flying at us with this sort of prehistoric kind of guttural scream. And, um, and it came right at us. And we got down and covered ourselves and started screaming. And we felt it whoosh over us. We actually felt the wind over us. We got to the top of those stairs so fast. We hit the hallway. We ran, 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 ran. We got outside, our hearts were racing, we were sweating. We just got in the car, took off. When we got to the set the next day, the crew members that were local hires, um, particularly the sound guy, had been down in the gas chamber and they had found a cell phone. They returned my cell phone and I said, my God, there it is. And he said, wait a minute. You went down into the death chamber at night? Yeah, we did. He goes, no, 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 no. Don't you know the history of this prison? And he started telling us the history of this prison. <laughs> this was the... The, the, the scene in 1980 of one of the most violent uh, and bloody prison riots in American history. <laughs> 1,200 inmates overpowered 25 guards, took them hostage, and fought each other. They dragged one prisoner out of a cell in death row and executed him in the spot where those marks were, in the concrete. <laughs> And they did it with an ax. Hit down on him, looked like about 10, 12 ax marks in the concrete. The, the black spot outside of one of the death row cells was the mark of a human body. that had been blowtorched. After hearing some of these stories and imagining the chaos uh, and the screaming and the noise, the din of 1,200 
prisoners taking over a prison and the killing that was going on and the absolute mayhem that was going on, now it makes sense to me why we heard these noises down in the death chamber. Maybe it was some spirit allowing us to hear this so that we would tell this story so no one would ever go back in that place. And it's an experience I'll never forget. I don't know if there's a message or not. I just know that uh, you have to have as much fun as you want in life. Because you don't know when you're going to leave. And the time will come whenever it comes. And respect what's after. Because I believe there's a lot afterwards, after your body is gone. I believe. I've been in, uh, in the industry as an actress since I'm 14 years old. I'm also a performer, a singer, and in the 90s, I had a lot of number ones and a couple of Grammy nominations, and uh, so I started touring all over Latin America and, and certain uh, cities of the United States. I had a best, my, my best friend. Uh, her name was Maritza. We were friends since we were 20 years old. If I would have had a twin sister, I think Maritza would have been uh, my twin sister. She was very fun and crazy. She just was someone that just loved life, completely made me laugh all the time. But she had moved to Aruba. I was in Colombia. I had a boyfriend there that I was visiting in my few days off that I had. And I said, you know, I want to go visit Maritza for a few days in Aruba. So I go to Aruba. I spend, you know, a few days with her, have a great, great time. Then I said, okay, I'm leaving, going back to the boyfriend, uh, but I want to come back and see you again, so I'll come back again afterwards. And I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay there in Aruba. We kiss each other, and I'll see you in a few days, you know? Um, then the limo goes. So we speak in the morning, and everything was great. And OK, well, so when are you going to come back? I was going to go back on the three days. I said, OK, I'll come back you know, tomorrow. Uh, so you know, we hang up. And then a few hours later, just a few hours, maybe two or three hours later, her brother calls me. You know, I'm like, hey, how you doing? What's going on? And he just said, Maritza is dead. And I'm like, oh, yeah, right. I just spoke to her. What are you talking about? Put her on. And he's like, she, she's not here. She was going to the airport to pick up some friends, and she went through a red light. I started to scream. I went completely, completely crazy. I started to scream. I went completely, completely crazy. I mean, I just didn't want to be there any longer. I, I wanted to go back, even, even though she was uh, she was gone. I, I wanted to be in the same place where she was. I grabbed the plane and I went back to Aruba. And then we met a few friends there and then we took her to bury her in, in Caracas, Venezuela. So when, when the time came for her to, you know, to look pretty on, on her coffin, uh, her mother didn't want to do it. So I said, I do, I do. 
It just gave me time to be longer with her and in private. And she was just beautiful. And, uh, you know, I made her look even more beautiful, I remember? Putting the color on her cheeks and, and her lips and everything, so. And, uh, you know, it was very, it was very hard, but I was so proud that I could, that I was able to do that for my friend. Um, she looked so peaceful and, uh, and so pretty. She looked as she was sleeping. After the funeral, uh, the following day, I go back to Miami, uh, where I, I, I was going to have a concert. I go to my hotel room, and she had this knitted kind of like shawl green. She had given it to me before, before she died. It was, you know, something that I loved, and she's like, oh, here, take it. And I put it on a chair. I go to sleep. I wake up with a very extremely strong pain on my chest, not near my heart. It was just one pain, like, bam, like that. You know, like, like, and that's the, and I wake up and, and, and then, you know, I look next, next, there was this chair next to me, next to the bed. And the shawl that was on the chair, it was no longer there. I don't know why. I don't know why. I just, uh, I just felt that it was her. I had to go back to sleep like this because every movement that I did was like the knife cutting me. I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, I, I still have this pain here. What am I gonna do tonight? You know, I can't, I can't move. How am I going to sing tonight? But I just go for it. You just got to, your mind has to be in control there. So uh, I wasn't going to cancel a concert. As soon as I got on the stage and the concert started, the pain went away completely, like, like nothing. And as soon as I stopped, the show, as the, other, the show was over, the pain came back on to me, like a knife cutting me open, and I can't move. I knew that that had nothing to do with doctors and me being sick or anything at all. For some reason, I just knew. So I call this friend of mine who back then, he, she was my publicist, and I tell her, I don't know what's going on. I think I have Maritza inside me. So I said, well, you know, we, we need to find a medium. And, and she, she made the appointment to go see this medium the following day. So I went, you know, to this uh, medium man, an older guy, Cuban guy, very sweet face, white hair were there and my mother was there and it all starts. Right away, he told me what happened. Right away without, a, without a, you know, a doubt. Oh, that's Marisa calling you. 
I, I had no idea that what I did was very dangerous. I had no idea about any of these things. He told me that it was while I was making her up and putting on her gloves, one of her arms was very, very stiff. You know, I mean, I, I couldn't move it. It was like very hard. I couldn't move her fingers. While the other side was completely soft, you know, like, like, like if she was alive. He told me that what that is, is that the spirit is leaving your body. So when the spirit is going away, that side is, is already gone. So it's, it's, it's you know, it's stiff, uh, rigid. And it's still on the other side. You know, it had movements because it was still there. And sometimes they can possess you while the spirit is going away. He told me that the pain was Marisa talking to me. That that was her trying to talk to me because I wasn't paying attention, and she didn't know she was gone. So she just punched me, like, listen to me, I'm talking to you, you know, kind of like angry, and to, to call my attention. Because they're, when they are in that, in that phase, they are, they're not in peace, they're, they're in anguish, anguish, and, and they're this, this, this desperate because, because, you know, imagine you talking to somebody and, and the, the person is like ignoring you because you know you're not there. So it comes a moment when that person becomes like, ah, listen to me. <laughs> so you know we're there, and we light a candle, and you know the guy starts saying, you know, Maritza, we're all here, we're all here. You know, we want to bring peace into you. Uh, you know, you, you got to let go, you got to let go. And then he, I'm, I'm saying the same thing, Maritza, please, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're here to bring you peace. You got to, you got to stop. The candle completely starts moving, like the, the flame, like, 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 there was no breeze, no doors open, nothing. There was no reason for the candle to be like that. The candle is like this, but then I'm freaking out when I see this candle. I start crying, and then all of a sudden, I see the guy, and his voice changes. It's me. There was no reason for the candle to be like that. The candle is like this, but then I'm freaking out when I see this candle. I start crying, and then all of a sudden, I see the guy, and his voice changes. It's me. I could hear that it was a woman's voice, uh, and, and with a little rasp, in, you know, completely different than the man's voice. <laughs> and then I hear the voice of Maritza. It was her. I could recognize that. And so the man started saying things that, you know, from our trips or things like that, that nobody knew except her and me. And so the man. I started, you know, doing things like that, like that, you know, I started talking and, and telling me things, and my pain was still there. And, you know, then all of a sudden, after, you know, after all that, slowly, 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 I see through the candle, through, through the flame, like a little, kind of like a little figure. She had hair like mine. It was Maritza. And then all of a sudden, the candle stops, the flame stops, like, like, like that. And then my pain goes away. That's when I knew that, that she was in peace, that she knew that she was, she was gone. Peace came into me because I, I knew that uh, she was 100% 
where she had to be. And, uh, you know, she was an amazing human being. And I'm sure that uh, her afterlife, where she's at right now, she's in peace right now, and she's happy. I was always one of those kids who wasn't afraid. Nobody could actually scare me. But I don't care who you are, if you all of a sudden see a ghost standing in front of you, I guarantee you, you will have a couple of extra beats of your heart. When I was a kid, I was fascinated with World War II. And I had the helmet and I had the gun and, and I was always playing, you know, soldier and I was always, you know, running, you know, through the woods and, and hiding behind the trees. I was always playing war, always. It was just uh, to the point of, of an obsession um, where even my mom was embarrassed to take me to, to a friend's house because I might start breaking out and playing war. fascination kind of grew into a, a into a very a very eerie situation for me in the house that I grew up in I loved my room my room was the coolest room ever I had a closet in my room it was very kid friendly in the sense that it was wide enough to play and and I remember being in this closet for long, long periods of time. That was my big thing, this closet. There was a time when I would be in my room asleep and I would all of a sudden wake up to the smell of cigarette smoke. I don't like cigarette smoke. It was really prominent, and it was in my room. My grandfather, he was a doctor, and he had a practice in the house, and he smoked. This was late at night, though. I mean, everybody was asleep. I looked around the room, thinking there was somebody in my room smoking, and there was nobody in the room. And there's a window that's right by my bed. I looked out the window to see if there was anybody outside, and uh, there was nobody outside smoking a cigarette. I looked around, didn't see anything, and I remember getting under the covers and the smell went away. The very next night, it was like three o'clock in the morning or something. I woke up with cigarette smoke again. It was really strange. There was a change in the atmosphere in that it was electrified. It was something different about it. There was only my breathing and there was only the, the sounds in the room, especially the clock. The clock was really loud, even though it was all the way across the room up on the wall. There was something that was really scary. And I don't know why, but I was drawn to the closet. And when I looked over there, and I don't know why, but I was drawn to the closet. And when I looked over there, in the closet were a pair of military boots. I was freaking out. I went to get my mom. She came upstairs. I'm 
And there was nothing in the closet. She looked around for me uh, to make sure there was nobody there. Went to the window, didn't see anything, didn't smell anything. I think it was just a bedroom. And so she tucked me in, gave me a kiss, and then uh, went back downstairs. Last night that this happened was the most intense. I, I was really afraid. I was really, really afraid, wondering, is this going to happen again? It was almost as though I knew it was going to happen. I was awake, waiting, and it's that waiting, waiting, waiting. The heaviness in the air was really prominent, the smoke came again. It was like everything just was amped up, just cranked up. The room itself was so loud. All of a sudden, everything seemed bright. Everything had this sort of silvery blue, and even that looked like it was really turned up. This chill went all the way up, right from my legs all the way up to my head, to the back of my neck. I, I could feel the chills of fear to the point where I couldn't. I wanted to yell for my mom, and I couldn't. I just couldn't. looked over towards the closet. There, standing in the closet, looking at me, was a young man in a World War II military uniform, and he was smoking a cigarette. His hair was combed perfectly, parted. His boots were the boots that I had saw the night before. and he smiled. It was almost like I was looking at him and he was looking at me. It was familiar. War is over. War is over. I wasn't afraid. I got out of the bed. And as soon as I walked over to this closet, the soldier was gone. There was something peaceful. There wasn't something scary. I'll never forget that feeling. I'll never forget that feeling. There was almost like a spiritual connection because there had to be something that offset the fact that there was a, a ghost standing in front of me in my bedroom. I always wondered about this experience, and I always wondered who that person was, why they came that night. I talked to a, a psychic. I mentioned to her about how I was not afraid of this apparition. She immediately had said to me, she past life. We have, through tragedy, through trauma, in death, that we have things that are just unresolved. They don't get resolved, but they can translate into another life. When I was there playing war, I was in the thick of that battle as a young man. And the psychic said, it was a young man. He went to war and didn't, didn't come back.
it was a, a past life of mine. And I was looking at myself standing there with this uniform on. She said, I think that what that apparition was telling you as a young child was that the war was over. Me saying to me that, you know, the war is over. And it's interesting because I don't like to fight. And after that, I, honest to God, don't even remember playing war that much anymore. There was blood everywhere, all over the walls, on the carpeting. I had this major fear that something was going to grab me. It was very scary. I'm looking around, and I realize we're in total darkness. It's not going to be good that we get stuck. And all of a sudden, it's like walking into the 1950s. We're looking around. We could not believe it. It was such a terrifying thing that affected all of us. I just picked my head up first, and I saw this shadow of someone sitting at the edge of my bed. I was freaked out. All of a sudden, this creepy chills kind of feeling came over me. I absolutely was scared out of my mind. I looked at the edge of my bed to where my feet were, and I saw just a shadow of a figure of something or someone standing there at my bed. It scared me for a long time. I grew up in a suburb east of Los Angeles, and my mother managed a condo complex. It was a 10 condo complex, and I grew up living in one of them. My parents divorced when I was about three and a half, four years old, and so my father moved out, and my mother continued to manage property to earn a living. I was always going with my mother into the condos to change light bulbs or paint walls. She liked to give me things to do just to sort of keep me busy, and it was our way of, I guess, bonding. One of the condos that was in the far back, there was something so dark and just scary and gloomy about it. I couldn't walk past it. There was just something about that condo that kept me away. I just wanted nothing to do with it. It was very hard to keep a tenant in that condo. The tenants would complain of yelling in the middle of the night. The door slamming. Strange banging on the walls. Furniture moving in the middle of the night, just rearranging itself. So there was definitely something going on with that condo. And um, the tenants moved out. One day, my mother was taking a crew of workers into the condo to get it ready for the next tenant to move in. And I didn't want to be in this condo. And I went in with her, with this crew. When I walked in, I felt like a cold blast of air. It was just a weird energy. I looked around and... There was blood everywhere. All over the walls, 
and the carpeting. And I seem to be the only one that sort of noticed that anything was going on. Nobody else saw the blood all over the place. It was very scary. Marissa? I didn't know what was going on, so I ran as fast as I could. It was the first time I'd ever felt anything like that, but I could never bring myself to tell my mother. That night, I was home alone, and my mother was working. And I would do my homework in front of the television in the living room. The minute I turned off the television, I felt this overwhelming sense that there was somebody there with me, right next to me, somebody right beside me. But there's nobody there, and, and as I look around and look for, for whatever it could be, the feeling would get stronger that there was something there with me. I had this major fear that something was going to grab me. And I had to run upstairs to my bedroom as fast as I possibly could. Halfway up the stairs. I turned around and I looked. And I saw a figure, just a dark shadow at the base of the stairs. I ran up to my bedroom as fast as I possibly could. Closed my door and tried to go to sleep. It was very scary. I told my mother about what had happened and she really never believed me. She just thought I was some crazy kid. She really felt like I was making it up. One night, I will never forget, I was sleeping. It was a hot night. I was on top of the covers. And something just shook me awake to the point where I was wide awake. My eyes were wide open. And as I looked to the edge of my bed, something just shook me awake to the point where I was wide awake. My eyes were wide open. And as I looked to the edge of my bed, I saw the same dark shadow of someone standing there at my bed. I was so scared. But before I could even realize what was standing at the foot of my bed, no! No! I hear my mother screaming from her bedroom, no, no, no. no! She was screaming in a way that I had never heard my mother scream, and I never want to hear it again. No! I didn't know what was going on, so I ran to her room as fast as I could, and she was asleep. She was having the worst nightmare, and I shook her awake. And I said, Mom, what's, what's going on? Are you OK? Are you OK? She was freaked out. 
She told me that her nightmare was about me. She had been dreaming about what I was going through. She thought what I saw at the edge of my bed was coming to hurt me, to take me, to do something to me. And that's why she was screaming, no, no. It was very scary. After we moved out of the condos, and as soon as I left, that's when I felt safe again. And I didn't notice any sort of paranormal activity or strange occurrences. When I was talking to my mother recently about how I felt living in the condo, she finally told me that one of the condos there was a murder-suicide. The husband shot his wife and shot himself. And that was the condo where I saw the blood all over the place. And I'm pretty sure this man who murdered himself and then murdered his wife felt the need to latch on to me. And follow me around my condo and make me feel scared for my life. It was really scary time for me. I'm just pretty happy it's gone now. Before this incident, if somebody told it to me, I would have said, please check your pills at the door. like 1981 and my friends called me and said do you want to work in the Dakotas they had a show that they would do from town to town around the country and at that time I was just kind of hanging out so I said sure we went to a town called Dickinson North Dakota and the whole time I was there it never got above two degrees we were there for three months working all kind of little places. So one night, we had to go all the way up to Rapid City. And we're working this bar. People are playing pool. They're shooting dice. And the beer is the darkest thing there. After we finished the show, we had a little hotel, and it was a terrible hotel room with a bed squeak even before you get into them. So I say to Jeff, who's the guy who ran the whole tour, hey man, let's get out of here tonight and we'll bail. We'll just go now. Can you believe that hotel, man? That was nasty. I can say that again. So we get going after about 11 o'clock at night. We're driving, and everything seems to be fine. And then all of a sudden, it starts fogging a little bit. We couldn't see nothing. And we're going slow. I said, Jeff. Why don't we speed it up a little bit, get going? And Jeff says, I can't speed up. What's wrong with the car? And says, not wrong with the car, but coasting. we've been coasting. Coasting, man, we got to get some gas. Then I'm looking around, and I realize we're in total 
darkness. There's just nothing. Finally, I said, Jeff, it's not going to be good, and we get stuck. And we thought, I did anyway, that we were just going to be dead popsicles in North Dakota. And all of a sudden, there's a little glittery light. And as we got closer, we realized it was a gas station. The gas station appeared out of nowhere. And I said, oh, mother of mercy, how is this happening? This is great. We get there, and we have to push the car off the road. And the pump is like one little pump, and it has the old-fashioned kind of pump things on it. So we're looking for the guy just to get to some gas. We open the door. And it's like walking into the 1950s. We see uh, the ice cream fountain place where there's drinks, and you can see where people could have ice cream sundaes and stuff like that. We're looking around. Hello. Hello. We're looking around, and it's like walking into the 1950s. And all of a sudden, it's a guy just standing there. He just appears. You heard no footsteps. He didn't walk in. He didn't run in. He was just there. And he's got one of these lumberjack shirts on and just a pair of, like, overall jeans. <laughs> Thank goodness for you. Boy, are we glad to see you. We need ourselves some gas. I don't sell gas. And I look at the guy and said, do you not have gas? Or is it just you don't want to sell us? And the guy gave me one of those sincere looks like, I really don't have any gas. But there's a station two and a half miles down the road. You can go there. And then I got like a little crazy because I said, Hey, we don't have any gas to get anywhere. Don't worry. You can get it. I was panicking, but he was so calm, like, don't worry, it'll start up and you'll go two and a half miles. So we get in the car. For some amazing, unbelievable reason, the car starts up. We drive literally two and a half miles, make a left. And all of a sudden, like an oasis, there's this huge, gas station. We get to the gas station, and there was a girl there 
We're talking to her and saying, thank goodness, the guy at the gas station down the road really helped us out, told us about you guys. We didn't even know you guys were around. And the girl looks at us and goes, there is no gas station down the road. We're the only gas station in town. And we look at each other like, and I said to her, we were at the gas station down the road, about two and a half miles down the road. It's got old fashioned pumps and there was an old guy there. And she looks at us and she said, there was a station there like 30 years ago. And the guy who ran it is long gone. She says, my dad knew the guy and he was a great guy. He would bring food to people. He always let people run tabs at the place. And then the guy had some tax problems and just closed down the station. And he committed suicide. And she said, when this happened, everybody was so crushed because he was always helping people. And we could not believe it. So we decided to drive back. But when we got there, there was no gas station. There was nothing there. And we look at each other and we realize something of the paranormal has happened. And we went on our way, that was it. Is that? It's the most unbelievable thing that I can ever remember being involved in. And you figure to this day, maybe this guy wanted to help people. And he came back from wherever he came back from just to help us for this brief moment in time. I definitely believe that when a spirit is not ready to go, they make their presence known. When I was 12 years old, it was myself and my little sister and my mother. We lived in a small apartment. My mom and my aunt, Esther, had a best friend, and her name was Maria. Maria and my mom met, and they became instant friends. Maria was just a light. She was always happy, and so they'd all do things together. You know, they were just three peas in a pod. My relationship with Maria was wonderful. She loved us. She didn't have any children. She wasn't married. So she treated us like her own. At the time, my aunt Esther was dating a man who was incredibly jealous, obsessive and controlling, not trusting of my mother or Maria. And she was trying to separate from this jealous person. So this one evening, Maria and my Aunt Esther were returning to my Aunt Esther's apartment, and he was hiding with a bat, waiting for them. And when he heard them come into the apartment, he came out and he scared them and was saying all kinds of things to them. 
And my aunt was able to run out the front door. But Maria went out the balcony. Being terrified to get away from him, Maria decided to try and jump from that balcony to the balcony underneath her. He came out and he scared them and was saying all kinds of things to them. And my aunt was able to run out the front door. But Maria went out the balcony. Maria decided to try and jump from that balcony to the balcony underneath her. And she missed, and she fell. Sixteen floors, fifteen floors, whatever it was, down to her death. I remember we had just returned home, and my mom got a phone call. And I'll never forget my mom becoming hysterical and crying. She was told that her friend Maria was dead. It was just really tough. It was such a terrifying thing that affected all of us. The days following Maria's death, the strangest things started to happen. My family is very spiritual and we do rosary readings for when someone passes. So the day of Maria's rosary reading, it was myself, my sister, my mom, and everything was quiet, of course. The mood was very somber. And then all of a sudden, the radio just blasted on and my mom was like, oh my God, I don't know what happened. I don't know who turned on the radio. What was that? So she turned it off, but we were like, how does the radio just turn on by itself? That's never happened before. It was really strange. And then we hear knocking on the door, on the front door of our apartment. And my mother gets up and she just looks out the peephole. And she says, who is it? Who is it? And there's no answer. We're all standing there because we lived in a small apartment. And my mom opens the door, and no one's there. And we were like, that's weird. And then it happened again. This time, it was me that went to the door. Of course, I looked through the peephole. Hello? Who is it? And nobody was there. It was as if someone was trying to come into the apartment. My mother tells us, it's okay, don't be afraid, and to go to bed. So I go to sleep, 
And that night, I just woke up out of nowhere. The room was so dark and kind of cold. I looked up from the covers. I just picked my head up first, and I saw this shadow of someone sitting at the edge of my bed. And at first, I thought it was my sister. I was like, did she wake up? Is she, what is she doing sitting there? And I'm looking, I'm trying to focus in. I was like, is that my sister? And as I focus in, I realize that it's M Maria, it's my mother's friend. And she's just sitting there. And I did not move. I was freaked out. I remember trying to yell out for my mom. Mama, but nothing would come out. It was, it was scary. I don't remember when I fell asleep after that. But the next morning, I remember going to my mother. I told my mom, I was like, Mommy, I don't know if I had a dream, but I saw Maria last night. She was on my bed, and she was watching me, and she was, it was dark, and I was so scared, and I was petrified, and I told my mom I didn't want to sleep in my room by myself anymore, and my mom just sort of held my hand, and she gave me a hug, and she was like, it's okay. And then my mother explained to me that it was just her spirit and that we shouldn't be afraid. She's a good spirit. She's not going to hurt us. She just wants to let us know that she's here, that she's watching over us, that she doesn't want to leave us. And then my mom told me that she was experiencing some things too and that her best friend was showing herself to her as well. And then, out of nowhere, this beautiful white bird just flew into our apartment. And it starts flying around all over the place. We're all watching this beautiful white bird flying around our apartment. And then it just flew right toward the window and flew right out. And it was gone. It was really magical. And my mom felt like the dove was Maria coming, maybe to say goodbye, that she was OK. After that, we never saw her spirit again. As far as spirits go and what happens to a person when they die, I definitely think that there's an in-between when they want to say goodbye to their loved ones. They want to see them again. They want to be with them. That's what I think about most. I've had experiences where things went bump in the night, but nothing as profound as this experience. Around 1986, I was working on a movie with Tony Curtis. 
We had been shooting for about three weeks. It was summertime, it was hot. And we were staying at this very old, beautiful hotel. The rooms there were big and barren and, and just big windows and quite sparse. We'd been working really hard, long hours, and I was exhausted. I knew I had the day off the next day, and I was ready for a good night's sleep. And so climbed in my bed. It's nice and quiet, and the room is pitch black. And all of a sudden, climbed in my bed. It's nice and quiet. And the room is pitch black. I was ready for a good night's sleep. And all of a sudden, this creepy chills kind of feeling came over me. And I remember just slowly being drawn to look up. I saw this white ball of light. I've never seen anything like this before. and I'm not even sure if I'm seeing what I think I'm seeing. My mind at this point doesn't know what to make of this. All I could do was look at this ball of white light. It was really scary. And this light in the corner of the room grew larger and larger and larger. It's getting bigger and bigger. And it is literally an arm's distance away from me, hovering over my face. And it started to take shape in some way. There was something familiar, which didn't make any sense to me at all. And it just hovered over me, and I could not tell you even for how long. And then... It was gone. I absolutely was scared out of my mind. The next morning, um, all I wanted to do was get the hell out of my room. I got dressed and I get out to the lobby and all I wanted to do is run outside. And the concierge stopped me and said I had just missed a phone call from LA. They were phoning to let me know that last night, that night, my manager had died. I met my manager, um, Eric, through my father, and I had done nothing at that point except some extra work. He believed in me and he really went to bat for me. 
and I relied on him heavily, and he was, um, he was always there for me. And we became good friends and confidants. We had that bond. And I think that's why that light was familiar. It was Eric, without a doubt. It made perfect sense he'd come to say goodbye. Looking back, it wasn't menacing, but I was petrified. He was a lovely, lovely, lovely man. So I know he probably felt horrible that he was terrifying me, <laughs> but he did his best to uh, communicate to me this, this tragedy. And I understood in retrospect why he would come to say goodbye. We didn't expect him to pass. I feel that Eric wanted to come to me first before I would hear from anybody else to let me know what had happened. I'm sure he just wanted me to know that, that he was okay. As we were around this, this, the fire telling ghost stories, the story was kind of horrific that your parent or caretaker could be so cruel. It's just a little too much to, to, to even think of. Whatever this was, it was, it was playing with me. Was he here? Was he not here? They got my attention. I saw this man lying flat on the floor. Don't drink the water. She said, I didn't tell any man to come here. I get a phone call, and there's nobody there. But I've never told anyone else because I'm afraid they'll think I'm cuckoo or something. But it's absolutely true. It was just the same tones over and over again. Da 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 When are they gonna stop? When I was growing up, ghosts were just um, something that were out of reach. Now in my life, I don't want to have a ghost experience. I put out this energy like, you ain't coming in. Um, and I guess that strategy or that capability was something that, that began to get exercised when I left Utah that, that day. We were busy doing the Brady Bunch, and at that time had uh, had developed some some very close friendships with my castmates. In fact, the home that we were at uh, was the grandparents of Michael Lookinlin, played Bobby. His family was vacationing for a couple of days, visiting their grandparents, and I was along for the ride on this trip. It was 1970, in the midst of the wilds of Utah. The town was Spring City, Utah, the very remote, small town. Creepy, because it was, it was like, you know, the middle of nowhere. On the first night we were there, we were all by the fire, and this is Mike's family. My sister around, at the time, I believe 10. Mike was around nine. His parents and his grandparents. And as we were around this, this, the fire, telling, ghost stories in this particular case, talking about the house and the history of the house. This house was the home of uh, some regional judge. 120 years earlier. And the judge would travel the circuit, uh, going to courts. You know, the judge apparently loved his first wife, who, who died uh, and lived that love through his daughter. 
The story was kind of horrific because apparently his second wife was jealous of his daughter. The judge is away. She locks her in the upstairs bedroom. The excuse being that maybe she had some communicable disease. And, well, more than neglects her. She starved her to death. And the daughter dies this horrible, you know, death uh, upstairs. That your parent or caretaker could be so cruel um, as to, you know, let you die, uh, you know, a slow, agonizing death like that. It's just a little too much to, to, to even think of. It did come up that the house is said to be haunted. I was a little creeped out by the concept of ghosts. The seed was set with, with, with that expression. Um, we were sent to bed, and Mike was right under the window. And I'm on a bed opposite him on the other wall, obviously room between us. And as I'm facing the wall, cuddled up and going to sleep, I hear footsteps. Oh my God, there's the ghost that we heard about. All the hairs in the back of my head start standing up and that goosebump feeling. And then I hear them walk by me. I didn't want to be frightened, but I was. I blurted out to Mike, Mike, did you hear that? Hoping he said no. Yeah. When he said yes, I think all the hairs on my body stood up. I bounded out of bed. <laughs> and ran right into his dad's chest, who was laughing his ass off. <laughs> because he was outside making these sounds. <laughs> Michael's dad was all about the practical joke. What I had heard wasn't, wasn't any ghost. Mike was behind me, but he wasn't anywhere near as frightened as I was. He was sort of laughing at me, which isn't really comfortable when I'm supposed to be sort of like in our little group, the little leader. Nonetheless, the fright had taken place. The house was now safe. The whole ghost thing sort of, it was spent. Um, I just go back to sleep. And then very early in the morning, I feel this sort of faint breath. I see these two dogs. They were like hunting dogs. There wasn't any dogs that I remembered in this house. None of that is necessarily computed in this moment. I look up and here's this girl, this the silhouette, with a nightgown and she had two little pigtails. I thought it was Teresa, Mike's sister. She's about 10 years old at the time. She was here, was in the house. I was asleep at that moment, and she is calling the dogs. I just go back to sleep. And the logic was, well, there's, there's a girl in the doorway, and there's a girl that age that is in this house. But somehow, because she was there, that made the dogs okay. It wasn't something to question. I wake up and we're all having breakfast in the morning. I ask, you know, hey, where are those, where are those dogs? And everybody looks at me like I'm freaking out of my mind. We don't have any dogs here. I 
I wake up and we're all having breakfast in the morning. I ask, you know, hey, where are those, where are those dogs? And everybody looks at me like I'm freaking out of my mind. We don't have any dogs here. And I said, I thought we didn't, but last night, Teresa was, there was dogs in my room, she was calling them out. Then I look at her and, you know, she's in sweats and thermals. She also doesn't have pigtails. Nothing similar to what I saw. Um, I'm already now flushed with the reality that I saw something that couldn't have been and now could only be explained as, as ghostly apparitions. She follow me. Then the parents take me out to the, the living room. They say, what kind of dogs? And I say, they were like hunting dogs, you know, like Ger German short hair pointer type dogs. And they point to the fireplace. Hunting dogs. Those are the dogs you saw last night. Yeah. 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 Those dogs. <laughs> That's what I saw. It was just creepy. You ever have one of those moments when you just, you know, like you just, you swerved and you missed something, and then like that 10 seconds later, you just, you have this rush of adrenaline and blood and heart pump, 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 pump. That's what happened. And then Mike's grandfather says, the second wife was, was said to, was, uh, to have also killed the judges to prize and loved hunting dogs. No! We've established that this woman was evil uh, and that she could um, starve a child the way that she did. <laughs> and brought upon this house uh, uh, some spirits that weren't ready to leave. It could be that the dogs were uh, involved in the afterlife protecting the girl spirit. That was what they did uh, in life. Maybe the reason I'm visited is because I'm the stranger. This is, you know, Michael's grandparents' home. He has been there numerous times. They probably were all okay. I'm the one that needs to get checked out. And was. I couldn't even really go back upstairs to pack my bag without Mike being with me or somebody being with me. It was such a creepy feeling. I, I wouldn't even to this day want to challenge myself by being in that environment again. I've never been that frightened um, ever, ever again. No! I think that the paranormal is, uh, is something that is very prevalent in our society. Whether you're Christian or not, you certainly believe in angels and you believe in the devil, you believe in the battle between good and evil. And why can't that manifest on Earth, right here with us? Absolutely, I think about it all the time. At this point in my life, I had just started modeling. I had just made my first little bit of money. I had a boyfriend who said, why not invest in a house? So we started looking on Long Island at, at homes, and I came upon this really big old house on a bluff in Long Island. Before I even arrived at the survey line of the land, I knew that this was the house that I wanted. I did feel like I was being called to the house. I didn't know why. It was stupendous, a beautiful view of the ocean, and. It was, it was just a really amazing looking house. It had fireplaces, which I like. It was a family owned house. It had come down from generation to generation in a family. It was a really big investment. It was very exciting. It was going to be a long-term commitment, a long-term investment. 
I knew that this was the house that I wanted. The first weekend I was in the house, um, I was upstairs and um, I heard my boyfriend downstairs. And I came downstairs and he was standing in the living room wearing a um, black coat and a, this funny little kind of aviator's hat that had been hanging on the fireplace. I don't know, maybe it was from a previous owner or whatnot, but it was hanging on the fireplace. And I thought that my boyfriend had put it on to, you know, play around with me. So I came down the stairs, I'm like, what are you doing? And he ran behind the fireplace. So I, I chased him. And he ducked behind the other side. And I chased him again. I was literally laughing and talking with him with his hat on. <laughs> and then my boyfriend came in the front door. He looked at me kind of strange and said, what do you want? I heard you calling. I said, oh, I, I wasn't calling to you. I thought you were here in the living room. This whole time. I was chasing you around the fireplace. I couldn't have been talking any louder than I'm talking now. I was just chasing you around. And he said, uh, no, I heard you yell for me. And that's why I came. Whatever this was, whether I was seeing something or it was an actual spirit in the house, uh, it, was, it was playing with me. But it was, it was a curious thing because I thought, am I losing it? <laughs> am I going crazy here? Was he here? Was he not here? And how did he hear me all the way on the other side of the property? It got my attention for sure. The next experience was I was in my bedroom and my boyfriend was behind me and he was just rubbing some cream on my shoulders. We both kind of stopped at the same time. I thought I saw the cat come around the corner, stretch out, and then, like, melt. And he said, isn't that funny? I know that we didn't bring the cats, but even without them, it feels like they're here. I said, did you see that too? He said, what did you see? I said, I thought I saw the cat, like, melt. He said, I saw the same thing. The only reason that I really thought I saw it was because he saw it too. That gave a, a little bit more strength to the fact that maybe there was something. Well, it was a really, really long time after that that um, I had a girlfriend come stay at my house. <laughs> We had a lovely evening together. We cooked, we sat around the fireplace, we played cards. And it was rather late in the evening when we all went to bed. I went to bed about 1.30 or so. The next morning when I woke up, they were gone. It was rather late in the evening when we all went to bed. I went to bed about 1.30 or so. The next morning when I woke up, they were gone. I mean, the bed was stripped and they were gone. I got a phone call from my girlfriend and she said, my husband couldn't stay in the house. Um, I said, well, why not? She said, well, he woke up in the middle of the night. Baby. And said that I was out of bed and messing around in my makeup kit. And, moving mascara around or whatever, and he said, come back to bed. And he rolled over and I was in bed. And he looked back to my makeup kit. Somebody else was there. It wasn't me. And he got very upset, and he woke me up. Hey, baby, come on. 
We gotta go. Come on, wake up. And he put me in the car, and as we were driving away, I went to uh, zip up my makeup bag, and I had to reach in to move some of my makeup around, and there was all this stuff all over my hands, and I realized that my mascara had leaked out, and that's what made me leave the house. And she said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you were standing there, and you were making a motion like this in your makeup bag. It was there, and then I rolled over, and, and I thought it was you, and then I rolled over, and you were there, and... and she thought he was kind of crazy, but um, I kind of understood what he was talking about. It's scary when that happens, because your brain goes into overdrive. You try to rationalize it. So I mean, I went and did a little research on, you know, paranormal things, and my girlfriend was very friendly with the Warrens, and um, she suggested that I have them come to the house. Mrs. Warren, she told us some things about the house that there was no way she could have known. The, the layout of the land, how the house had been, the nearby cemeteries. It was pretty intense. It was, pre it was pretty amazing. She was saying that, yes, there was something. But it's friendly. It wants something. It had been one of the previous owners of the house. And they were supposedly buried in a uh, close by, a nearby cemetery. And um, that it was a big family that lived in this house. And it was a very big, loving family. This house had its own guardian angel. My opinion is that if a spirit comes to you in a menacing way, then it doesn't want you there. If it comes in a form that is benevolent and familiar in, in a form that you love, then I can't imagine that it's telling you it doesn't want you there. Maybe it's trying to communicate with you in some way. Whatever I had seen had come in a familiar form. It came in a friendly way. It came as something I loved. It came in the form of my boyfriend. It came in the form of my cat. So these are benevolent. It was welcoming and making me feel good about being there. And in fact, I, I took very good care of that house. Absolutely, it was meant to be that I was there. I wanted to be there and it wanted me there. Before I tell the story, I want to tell you, I want to preface it by saying, I was the worst skeptic, a real skeptic. I didn't believe anything. I thought everything that did happen was like a coincidence. But this story, it goes beyond a coincidence. It was 1968. At that time, I hadn't worked for a few months, quite a few months, and I was getting a little desperate. I was a little worried about my career and everything. We were living in a house, and it was here in LA, and it had two floors. So the kitchen was on the first floor, obviously, and my wife was upstairs in the bedroom in the second floor. I was playing tennis, and I got through playing tennis, and I walked about three blocks to my house. And I went in the back door. And when you went in the back door, you came into the kitchen. And when I came into the kitchen, I saw this man lying flat on the floor. And he was in work clothes. And he had the, the plumbing thing, the, the plunger. And then all of a sudden, he got up. And I could see him with the white beard. The beard was very prominent. I think it's because his hair was sort of blackish. I said, well, what, what are you doing? What's the matter? He said, oh, nothing, nothing, nothing serious. But uh, don't drink the water for a while. I said, what? Don't drink the water. 
I said, why? Is there something wrong with the law? He said, no, don't, no, 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 just stay away for, for a while. Okay. Well, all right. So I left the kitchen. I went upstairs to the bedroom where my wife was. I said, the plumber down there says not to drink the water. She said, what plumber? Who's downstairs? I said, the man that's down there in the kitchen fixing the sink. She said, I don't know. I didn't tell any man to come here. I said, what, what do you, come on down, I'll show you. So she comes down with me. And there's nobody in the kitchen. It's completely empty. The kitchen sink is all fixed and everything. So now we look at the living room and the dining room and the porch, and there's nobody there. We look out in the backyard and no one is there. I said, Pat, I swear to you, there was a man here fixing the kitchen sink. And she said, really? I said, yes. He was laying right there. I said, well, he says not to drink the water. You, you, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Repeatedly, he said. I said, I'm telling you what he said very definitely. Don't drink the water. I don't think she thought it was the ghost right away. She, she thought maybe there was somebody that was there without us calling. She thought about it. It took a, a few days, and then she began to think, oh, my gosh, that might have been a ghost. See, my wife is very gullible, and she believes in psychics and all that, and I don't. Me, I'm a real skeptic, so I figured I'd just leave it alone. Then I get a long-distance call, because my, my the wife's mother was in, back in New York. My wife's mother is a, claims she's a psychic. And she used to have seances at my li living room. As a matter of fact, I used to go outside in the backyard, and while they were having the seances, I used to go, ooh, ooh. And they didn't know it was me. They used to think it was coming from the, underneath the table or something. So my mother-in-law calls up, and she said, is everything going all right? And I said, yes, everything's fine. And she said, because I had a dream that you shouldn't drink the water. I said, what? She said, you don't drink the water. I said, oh, come on, Pat put you up to this. That's my wife's name, Pat. She said, no, no, don't drink the water, goodbye. And I went up to Pat, I said, did you tell her to say that? And Pat said, no. She was very innocent looking too. So I, it was very strange that both people told me not to drink the water. The next day, I get a phone call from my agent. And I said, hi, bud, you got a job? He said, yep, you're gonna leave in two weeks. You got a big show, it was a big hit on Broadway, it was written by Woody Allen. I said, gee, that's great. What show did Woody Allen write? And he said, the show is called Don't Drink the Water. What? I couldn't believe my ears. Woody Allen was very famous at the time and I wasn't used to not working, so I was very happy to get the job. A little scared, but happy. I've never really shared the story with anyone except my wife and my three sons, but I've never told anyone else because I'm afraid they'll think I'm, I'm making it up or I'm cuckoo or something, but it's absolutely true. I've never really shared the story with anyone except my wife and my three sons. I've never told anyone else because I'm afraid they'll think I'm I'm making it up or I'm cuckoo or something, but it's absolutely true. Two weeks later, I left to do this play. It was in Florida, at the Coconut Grove Theater in Florida. Uh, when I tell you this, you're gonna say, this is so scary. When I tell it, I get scared. We rehearsed in the play for a couple of weeks. I was very happy, I had a good part. The cast was very nice. We all became very friendly. On opening night, the show went very well. And then after the third act, we went out for the curtain call. You can only see about the first three rows when you're taking a curtain call. The rest of it is all darkness. 
And as I bowed down, I looked over to my right. And there in the third row on the aisle was the plumber, the man with the beard. He was sitting there staring at me. He was not wearing overalls, he had a suit on. And then the curtain came down, so I thought maybe I, you know, I was seeing things. But then when the curtain went up again, I looked over there, and there he was, staring at me. And I knew it was the same man with the beard. I, I, I couldn't have been wrong. My knees were shaking. They say your knees shake, and they really do when something like that happens. Now, some people think I should have gone out the front and seen if he came out of the theater. But I didn't do that. I was almost too shocked to, to even move. I never saw him again. Never saw that face again. Only that first night of the curtain calls. And I looked every night. I looked at the audience real sharply, and I never saw it again. I think that some power bigger than me knew that I was such a skeptic that I wouldn't believe it. They had something happen to me that made me a believer. It's a true story, and I'm a believer now. And ever since then, my career has changed. I've been very lucky. I never stopped working again. Maybe they figure, well, now he's accepting me, so we'll see to it that he works. It's good to know that there's something out there that maybe protects us, you know? It's something that's more powerful than us that takes over and keeps us out of trouble. If you look at it that way, you do feel more comfortable, I think. Something is taking care of us. I grew up in a house where Ghosts do not exist. There is no there is no life after death. No one's coming back from the grave. And I think that was just their way of protecting us from being really, really scared all the time. Because I lived on in this house that was like five acres of land, but just in the at the end of a dead end dirt road. So no, there were no ghosts <laughs> that I know of in my house. <laughs> So it was about 10 years ago. Um, I was an unemployed actress, and I was crashing at my friend's house, and they lived on this big piece of property. And on this property, there was an enormous driveway that would drive all the way up to these houses. And on the property were two houses side by side. And my friends, Peter and Kathy, were renting the house on the left. And the woman that owned both the houses lived in the house on the right. They said I could crash in the maid's quarters. And I thought, this is this is heaven. I can live in a big house with, with my best friends. And I love their children. They had a son named Keaton, and they had a daughter named Callie. She was about two months at the time. It was a wonderful place to be. About, it was like a month in, I started to feel stressed by my roommates only because they would be loud at night. I thought someone was up making dinner at 12 o'clock at night. They're gonna be up in the kitchen and it was just unfortunate that my room was right off of the kitchen and I would hear, in my room, I would hear sounds in the kitchen all the time. It felt like someone was cooking a feast. They had children, so I always kind of blamed it on the kids and understood that, well, you're living with people and you know, you feel like you don't want to say anything. And I never really wanted to um, until it started getting really loud. There were some nights where I would hear um, whistling I 
I always assumed it was just one of my friends in the kitchen with one of the children because it wasn't a loud, annoying whistle. It was just the same tones over and over again. It sounded da 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 over. That was all it was. It was enough that I could lie in bed long enough and think, when are they going to stop? When are they just going to get out of the kitchen so I can sleep? That's, I would hear it for months and months, and it never changed. The song never changed. Finally, one night, the minute I heard the whistling, I jumped out of my bed. I went down the long hallway, and I was ready to say, stop it, just stop the whistling. And I went into the kitchen, and it was empty. It was obvious that nobody was in there, and it was obvious that no one had been in there. It wasn't like a light just went off, or a pot was still warm. And I went and found them, and they were completely in their, in their master bedroom, as far away as possible, watching TV. One baby was asleep, Keaton was awake, the, the older son was awake, and I was, at that moment, I felt like, okay, you guys, <laughs> who was in the kitchen? Like, this is crazy. I had been hearing somebody for months. They thought I'd lost my mind. They were all like, we weren't in there, and they obviously hadn't moved from the bed. So I tried to pull myself together, and I just remember the long walk back to my room in terror. Just, I have to go through that kitchen. What is going on? What what am I hearing? But that's that was really the first night I think I knew in my gut that there is something else making these sounds. So I tried to pull myself together, and I just remember the long walk back to my room in terror. Just, I have to go through that kitchen. What is going on? What what am I hearing? But that's that was really the first night I think I knew in my gut that there is something else making these sounds. That night, I was lying in my bed, and it was so quiet. And I was lying there, and I heard a soft but clear whisper of my name. Marissa, Marissa. And my first instinct was that it's someone in the kitchen who needs me. And I got up and thought, well, I'm gonna go to the kitchen, but I was gonna go and scare them because of all the things I'd been telling them. I'm gonna scare them. And I got down as slow as I could, and I was just walking down as quiet as I could, and then I jumped out. I saw this thing turn at the same moment as me and jump as well, and it was this woman with long, stringy bright hair, and like her eyes were piercing at me and her face was like sunken in. She was, she looked like she was sick and she was really pale and she was in this like shadowy gray, like I don't really, I couldn't say what exactly. It seemed like just, she was just this presence and her hair was, it's her hair that I remember the most. And I was so terrified at that moment because I knew that that moment I had seen something that I never believed it. I turned around as fast as I possibly could and I just ran into my room and hid under my blanket. I was too scared to go to Peter and Kathy. I was too scared to go to the other side of the house because I didn't want to go through the kitchen ever again at nighttime. And I, I, I just thought for sure this person was going to come into my room and kill me. I 
didn't sleep all night. I was horrified. And the next morning, I told Peter and Kathy the story, and no one really believed me at that moment, and everyone was just kind of making fun of me. But that day, Kathy picked up photos of all of us. And in, in the photos that we got back, all the photos of Callie had big swooshes through them. It's like if someone took an eraser and just kind of washed through it. And I, of course, was the first one to go, oh my gosh, that's, there's something going on here. This ghost that I saw, this woman that I saw in the kitchen was tied to Callie. I just, at that moment, knew it because we always thought there was something really special about Callie. She'd always be staring off, always staring off. She'd always be looking around and smiling at things. And we'd be like, oh, Callie's looking at angels, because she'd always just have this, like, joy. But not at me, not at us. It was that she had this joy at something that was right off of us. We never really knew what she was looking at. Keaton's pictures were fine, my photos were fine, Peter's pictures were fine, Kathy's pictures were fine, but it had these swooshes through Callie. That's when Kathy was completely on board. That's when Kathy said, oh, yeah, this is, there's something in this house. We convinced Peter to go over and talk to Helen, our landlord, and ask, who used to live in the house? What's the story with the house? Helen told us that she built the house next door for her son and his new wife, and that they moved in when they had a child. They had a little baby girl, and they all three moved into the house. And a few months after they moved in, she told us that her daughter-in-law's mother was sick, and she was dying of cancer, but she wanted to be as close as she could be to her granddaughter. So she lived there, I think it was about six months, she said, before she died in that house. And after that, her son and her daughter and the granddaughter moved out because they didn't want to live there anymore. And I was like, oh my God, she's at the house, Helen. She's there. I hear her in the kitchen at all hours. And, and Helen said she, she took care of my granddaughter. She held my granddaughter at night. She would always take the night shifts. And that was like her time with the baby. She hummed to her granddaughter to put her to sleep. The hours of humming and the, the, the amount of whistling that I heard was as if she never put that baby down. She probably held her until she died. I think my name was whispered because I was living in her room. I think that she wanted me out of her room. I didn't feel confident and safe that I wanted to stay in that house. I left exactly one week later because Donna wasn't leaving, so I was going to have to. It's like I now don't think people are crazy when they tell ghost stories. I have that same feel when I hear stories of other people it's because of Donna, it's because of her. I 100% believe in something beyond us because she made herself known to me.